Good morning, everyone. It's nice to see you here this morning. Uh, we're going to continue the study on Judges chapter 9 and, and try to understand its implications for the present. Uh, but before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Most gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning uh, with a great need, a burden upon our heart for those um, who are searching for truth and people in this message and people who have been searching and looking for truth and have been unable to find it. We ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit can lead and guide them. We know there's much we do not understand and we are struggling and seeking to know your will for us today. We pray for um, each person who is watching these videos and participating. We ask that you can help them in their personal struggles that they face each day. That we can know your forgiveness and love. And that we can know your power in our lives. Help us to minister to those around us. May your angels watch over us. May your Holy Spirit uh, speak to their hearts as well as ours. Be with us now in the, this study as we open your word together is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> um, so good morning, everyone. Now, we started on uh, the chapter 9 of Judges, trying to put this on a line. And what we have understood uh, is that um, the parable of Jotham represents the message of Samuel Snow, which represents a particular aspect of our message. And this um, chapter goes, so even though this comes after the story of Gideon, we don't just take it that, you know, Abimelech then is carrying up where Gideon left off. That's not how we look at it. Each of these um, waymarks, each of these judges is a waymark in the line of the judges. And each waymark, when we zoom into it, uh, gives us information regarding the entire line to some degree, sometimes more detail um, than others, but it's illustrating that line. Now, Abimelech is an illegitimate son of Gideon. And Gideon, we know, is about the message of July 18th. But Abimelech's conspiracy goes back prior. So there was a question uh, regarding, um, uh, in that was in the chat, we discussed it a little bit. Um, well, it wasn't in the chat, I guess. It was, we just discussed it. Um, had to do with why, when we were looking at Gideon, it seemed more about our time. But when we look at Judges 9, it's addressing, it's going further back. And so we're going to address that point. Um, because, I mean, Judges 9 is going to deal with Abimelech, what that is, what that error is, what that darkness is. And um, then also um, the parable of Jotham and who Jotham is. And then also Abimelech's fall and what that means. So... <clears throat> now, in this case of, of Abimelech, Abimelech technically would be a judge in that he, he sets himself up as king. So maybe he's not a judge. He's a king. He's the first king um, that Israel is going to have. So technically, Saul is not the first king, though he's the first one anointed by God. Um, so Abimelech is a counterfeit king in that sense. And um, this conspiracy, what we did is we looked at this conspiracy and we, we saw how this goes back to a conspiracy in our history. The conspiracy that uh, occurred with uh, Parminder and uh, others who had a secret Bible study. And that secret Bible study produced... Um, a 
prediction about the timing of the Sunday law that was rejected by the movement, but eventually somewhat accepted. So initially in 2012, when Parminder was a part of this, had, had this secret Bible study group, one of the persons, Tabo, who was in that secret Bible study group, um, which was done, you know, through email and online, um, he he was living with me, so uh, so I knew a little bit about what was happening, but I wasn't allowed to know about what they were teaching or what was going on. So I knew that Parminder was part of that group. I knew that Parminder had made this prediction about the Sunday law. I knew what Jeff had said against it, but Tabo was not forthcoming in, in letting me know about what was happening. So I found that kind of odd, but I figured Parminder's just a fanatical mind. I didn't really know him personally. And uh, so I just kind of dismissed the whole thing. Um, at that time. But of course, Parminder came back into the movement, um, won his way back in. And by 2016, of course, he was um, then uh, made an elder in the movement and actually given the responsibility of organizing uh, the movement. And so, so Parminder now had uh, a toe in the door that uh, had opened up uh, to this huge responsibility in spite of the fact that he had been accused of fanaticism. And I guess he, you know, Jeff had known him for a lot of years and uh, Jeff then uh, began to trust Parminder again, obviously enough to make him an elder along with uh, Tabo and uh, Marco. So we had these three elders and of course, all kinds of things were happening behind the scenes that we don't know anything about. But we do know that uh, jealousies arose. Um, people like Mark Bruce obviously were not happy that they were made elders, and he wasn't. Um, and uh, other things were going on with Mark Bruce as far as his connection with uh, the work in uh, Jamaica and the group in, in Alabama, which later on came up. But at the time, we didn't know anything about it. So... There was uh, all of the all of these things happening in the movement are we are representing as this period of darkness. So this period of darkness is important to understand the reform line itself. Now, every time you have a reform line, you have a period of darkness, and the reform line addresses that, whatever that period of darkness is. Um, and there's always going to be a first message and a second message. The first message has to be accepted for anybody to accept the second message. But the main point of the reform line is the third message. That is the third message, which is the test and presents a closed door. And um, that third message, when we look at reform lines, it's never going, going to be empowered. It, it's going to go through a formalization, um, but it's ultimately going to be um, set aside in some way by the first generation. And, and so this is one thing we still have not fully understood. Or we haven't fully addressed it. We haven't come to... Uh, consensus or anything on it is what that means. What we can say is that all of the third messages that have been given, that have arrived, all of them uh, receive their empowerment in the Sunday law. So why would that be? Why is it that this third message arrives but it's never empowered until the Sunday law in every single line that we have. Why is that? I don't know if people thought much about it. 
because we have these reform lines. So three-step testing prophetic message. And even when we say it's in the Sunday law, in some ways it's at the close of probation for the world, but those are all kind of tied together. That's That Sunday law period goes from the Sunday law to the close of probation. So we have these closed doors, right? So there's a closed door associated with the third angel arriving. Think about Millerite history. Did the door close on October 22, 1844? Yes, it did. And as to your question, I'm thinking, well, we're all being tested gradually with the first and second. And so our, our, our character is supposed to be refined enough to be able to withstand the, the Sunday law when the great third test comes. Okay, so you said that the door closed October 22, 1844. Now, right. we know that the door did not close in the sense of the close of probation for the world. Right. So the Millerites initially believed that that was going to happen. That is the third message is the shut door message. And we've seen that happen in our time. Several times we would have this shut door message um, being presented and the shut door that the Bible presents is the idea that let him that is righteous be righteous still, let him that is filthy be filthy still. Um, it's a close of probation, which ultimately only occurs one time in history. Now, sure, people's probation closes close when they die, and people can reject light to the point that no further light can affect them. Right? That can happen. So, in a sense, their probation closes. I mean, and maybe it is possible because we could see it in somebody like... Uh, Enoch or Elijah, whose probation closes without dying, that is, they perfect a Christian character and can enter into the fellowship of heaven. And there may be other individuals throughout history who have been sealed in that sense, that they, they have experienced um, something that would be akin to the close of probation for them, that is, they're not going to turn back. But in a general sense, we know that there comes a point where everyone has made their decision and God is going to declare the righteous as righteous and the wicked as wicked and the righteous man will not turn from his righteousness and the wicked will not turn from their wickedness, no matter what happens. And so the righteous are going to be tried in the most trying circumstances. So they're going to go through the time of Jacob's trouble seeing themselves as sinner, experiencing what Christ experienced at the cross, that separation from God, and yet will not turn from their righteousness. And the wicked will not repent of their wickedness, even though the plagues are falling upon them. Even though it's clear that they have been in error. They're not going to repent. So they have closed their probation. And that is a one-time event in history. We don't have that situation today. We have never had that situation in the past. And the Millerites expected the door to close to the wicked on October 22, 1844. And for a short time, Ellen White even believed that the only people that could be saved were those that accepted the second angel's message when it was given. That there was not going to be a door. The door of mercy had closed. Now, she came to understand that there was a closed door in 1844, but it wasn't to the entire world. So she compares these closed doors to other closed doors. Um, for instance, uh, with uh, Noah, his, his wife and his three sons and his wife, their wives, even though the world perished, the wicked had closed their probation. That wasn't the end of things. Right, We're going to have uh, things that occur that show that man is not 
um, made perfect at, as pertaining to the conscience. So sin has still continued. But that closed door that happens with uh, in connection with the history of the Sunday law is the end of sin. So it is a one-time event. <clears throat> and so often, you know, we, we don't really fully understand how these lines all relate or all come together with the close of probation at the end of the world. But that's one of the things we need to understand. So we have the darkness at the beginning of a reform line. And that darkness is some misapprehension of truth. And then we have a reform line, but that reform line is going to uh, bring us light. The, the light of which needs to be understood at the end of the world. It may not be fully understood in that reform line. But that's why we can take all of these reform lines from the past and we can bring them to our time and we can see that they're illustrating the truths in God's word that are going to be needful for the final generation in order to stand in that time of the Sunday law and particularly in the time after the close of probation. <clears throat> so when we look at, so there's tons and tons of symbols here in this story of Abimelech. So we know, of course, Abimelech is this illegitimate son of Gideon, but there are 70 legitimate sons. And Abimelech is going to conspire and he's going to uh, use 70 pieces of silver to hire vain and light persons uh, to accomplish this purpose in killing the 70 sons of Gideon, right? And this is going to happen upon one stone. Yet one of them, one of the sons, Jotham, he's going to escape. We say that he's the, 70, the, the 70th week. He's a symbol of that week of Christ. <clears throat> and then um, Abimelech is going to be made king in the valley of Shechem, which is uh, between Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal. And Jotham is going to go up onto the top of Mount Ebal, or Mount Gerizim, upon the Mount of Blessing, and he's going to state this parable. And this parable then is a message <coughs> which we understand relates to our lines. We haven't drawn it out yet. We haven't figured out how to place that parable in the lines. Um, now, we did go back and, and say that this, that in this story itself, this parable has a meaning. And that meaning must refer to the first three uh, periods in which the people are seeking to have the judges become kings, but that they're going to reject that. We see that explicitly stated in the story of Gideon, where Gideon rejects the idea that he's going to be a king. But now here, these ones that were these fruitful trees that are represented that in some ways had uh, a legitimate claim, I guess, uh, to be kings, these messages, these judges, that um, they, they turn this down, but the bramble accepts this, right? Now, when we look at the story, of course, it looks like Abimelech is, you know, convincing them that he should be king. But obviously the people go along with it. So, you know, in the story, they're not actually begging him to become king. He's asserting himself to become king, which wasn't done with the others. And that's why they rejected um, the demand to, to become a king instead of just a judge. And, and what's the difference between a king and a judge?
in this case, church and state, the civil power and the church power, or the religious power. Um, well, yeah, so the king often combines the two, but he doesn't always, you know, so. And a judge is is still a kind of civil power, just like a king. I mean, in both, in some cases, they have to have God's um, leading and guidance. Um, but I mean, one of the, on the simple level, one of the differences is that a king would have um, his son then would become leader, right? So you're setting up. Um, uh, what's the word? A line of succession, right? So once you have a king, the idea is that his son will be king, and and then his son will be king, and that's what that's what happened with the kingship in the Bible was Saul being made king. Uh, that was the idea that was going to happen, and instead, uh, David is made king. Um, God chooses David because Saul is, in a sense, rejected. So Saul's the the line or the promised seed doesn't come through Saul. It's going to come from David. But that is going to continue all the way to Jehoiachin. Of course, uh, the uncle of Jehoiachin, Zedekiah, is made king after him, but the seed doesn't come through him. It comes through Jehoiachin. So Christ is a descendant of Jehoiachin, but not Zedekiah. Um, so we know that it's going to be overturned, 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 right? From So Babylon basically takes that over, um, and then it's going to be overturned to Medo Persia, then to Greece, and then to Rome, and then Christ is going to come in the time of Rome, both in the time of pagan Rome and in the time of modern Rome, right? So... Um, Christ comes the first time in pagan Rome, and he'll come the second time in modern Rome. Because <clears throat> there is only four kingdoms, even though Rome is divided into pagan, papal, and then modern. Yeah, so in uh, so Angela talks about a counterfeit, which we would agree, and that's Psalm uh, 68. Probably need to clean my glasses because <clears throat> I can't see anything. So, what, what's that verse? Can you can you read it there, uh, Angela? Yeah, I can read it. <clears throat> the last part of it just popped into my head a little while back. Rebuke the company of spearmen, the multitude of the bulls, with the calves of the people, till everyone, which uh, till everyone is supplied, submit himself with pieces of silver. Scatter thou the people that the light in war. So this is the conquest of evil people who are supposed to be submitting to God, right? And here we have evil people who are going to be submitting to an evil ruler to fight against the people that were supposed to be ruling over them. Okay. Which which verse was that? Psalm? Psalm 6830. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, I mean, and that's what we've, we've taken the position, of course, that this is a counterfeit. What Abimelech, uh, his name means my father, the king, and, um, <clears throat> and he seeks this, and he becomes anointed king, and then we have this parable against him. So the way that we... Uh, tried to address this because the question is why are we going back so I'll show you what I think I understand the question is <clears throat> so when we deal with um, Gideon and we have Jeroboam and Gideon his two names are representing two different lines um, we can see that this is going to go from 11-9 to December 25th 2021 the 777 days and um, uh, but we're going to see that there is this fourth message, something we still haven't fully addressed. But we know that the third angel arrives. Um, and uh, this is representing a closed door. So this is a closed door regarding this whole line. 
That is, you have to accept the first and second if you're going to be benefited by the third. And this third is this, this message that still has to come to its culmination. Now, um, with Judges 6, 7, and 8, we each had these separate lines. And then when we get to um, the Judges line here, so we're looking at the Judges line here, we had Gideon. Now we have Jotham. Now, we know that Jotham um, actually addresses this entire history, but we put him here because the primary way in which we understand Jotham's line is that, um, just like Samuel Snow's letters, after the empowerment of the first message and prior to the formalization of the message, the second message, there is this prediction before midnight. And so we're saying that Jotham's parable, parable is represented here. And yet we know that the parable goes way back. It, it gives us a history of this conspiracy, right? So this conspiracy means that in this message, we've had... Um, a conspiracy that has reached back over this period of time prior to the divisions that began in the movement, because we see the divisions be first occur in 2014. And, and so there's some problems in trying to understand this. Now, when I put Jotham's line here, I put this 777 days, just like we had with Gideon's line. And we haven't drawn this line out yet as far as what these way marks are and whether we would just, if we took Jotham's, jo, Jotham's line and began it at November 9th, 2019, we know that when we put November 9th, 2019, what we're doing is we're zooming into the arrival of the second angel's message that is marked at 9-11. That is, when we address... The, the, the arrival of the second angel's message, we place it at 9-11 because it is in a line above. And that November 9th, 2019 is related to that whole line from September 11th, uh, 2001 to the Sunday law because this is the time of the Sunday law. And so our line is typical. Now, we know that Gideon's line addressed 9-11 addressed because it addressed 9-11 in that it's the end of Parminder's line. There's a closed door on November 9th, 2019 to those that accepted Parminder's message wittingly, understandingly. That they're, as, as, as a group, as a movement, they're not going to repent. Whether there's individuals who, you know, were deceived, who are going to later see the light, that's another issue. Um, but that is, is a closed door. So in a sense, we could even argue that that is an arrival of the third message. Now, we know that what happened on November 9th, 2019, there was a new message that is being presented, and that has to do with the 273 uh, connected to the Mayan calendar, which is going to give us all this light um, that is, is being given in this line of Jotham. So <clears throat> the simple way that I look at the line of Jotham is we put all of these dates, right? So we said that um, we could just take these and and create um, um, these these meetings where I presented uh, specific messages. That is the messages that ended up leading to our understanding of July eighteenth. And, and beyond. So um, the first one I put is like either 2012 or 2010. I'd probably put 2012. 
Then the formalization is 2014, the empowerment 2016, the second angel arriving 2017. So 2016 is going to be uh, dealing with Ezekiel. Um, now we have here 14, we don't have 15, right? So we have 14, 16. The second angel arrives in 2017. That's going to be the message dealing with Samuel Snow's letters. And uh, so in 2017, this is just presented at the School of the Prophets, uh, not at the camp meeting. But that's going to be uh, also specifically the, the July 18 date as a symbol of the prediction before midnight, which comes from Samuel Snow's letters. And that's going to be presented 777 days prior to November 9th, 2019. And then 2018 is going to be um, probably October 13th, 2018. But of course, it encompasses more than that. And then this is going to be 2019. And that's going to be um, uh, probably November 9th. Right. And then 2020, uh, this is going to be the message in connection with July 18th. But there's a bunch of other things connected with this as well. What's being presented in 2020, probably even um, along with the disappointment that happened. So so when I'm doing this, we're saying that this reaches back further than this 777 days. Right. So this 777 here which initially I placed, I said, well, you know, maybe we could understand this in some other way. Now, one of the ways we could look at it um, is it could be referring to a period of seven years in some way, but I don't know. Uh, what, this, what this line of Jotham does, and, and I think there's different ways in which we can understand it, because I still think this 777 is valid. Now, remember Samuel Snow's letters. How many days is it from the writing of his first letter to the publication of his last letter? Um, five, three. Yeah, so 153 cardinal days. If we counted in inclusively, it'd be 154 days. That is, the July 18th letter is published on the 154th day from when his first letter is written, right? And 154 is 77 plus 77, right? But we also had counted it initially when I found the center of the chiasm being May 2nd. I had counted using the writing of his first letter, which is February 16th, as a symbol of two months and 16 days. So I counted from February 16th, two months and 16 days, and that gave me May 2nd. And then I counted again, 216 days, that gave me July 18th. May 2nd, of course, is his second letter. We don't know when it was written, we just know when it was published on May 2nd. And so we can see that in Samuel Snow's letters, that the 77 is represented, right? That is the 77 symbolizes the 777. So 154 or 153, if you're doing it as a cardinal count, number of days, relates to this 777 structure, but only in a, in a symbolic way. Right? Not literally 777 anything. <clears throat> so, um, if we're going to take this, though, as this Jotham, Jotham line, that this is Jotham, um, I don't know if we could take the parable and just put the parable on this line. So that's what I was trying to do initially. The same, well, maybe we could put this parable upon this line. But we don't we don't see that the parable fits this line. The parable is telling us more about 
the period of darkness that precedes this line in some ways, right? So, so Jotham has more than one line. So if, if we're going to address this light, this is a light that's developing during the time that this conspiracy is occurring. But Jotham is going to come to express his parable at a specific time. So when is the parable of Jotham? It's happening during the, the coronation of Abimelech, right? So he's talking, but he's giving a message about past history. So when he gives this, this parable about the past history leading up to the present, when is he giving that? I don't know if I'm asking the question very well. Isn't he giving that at the outset? Well, he, he's he's his parable is covering the past, right? So he's not giving the parable before it happens. He's giving the parable after it happened. He's giving a historical application. Right. So before, now before the rest of the things are happening. Well, the rest of the things that are happening, I mean, Abimelech is going to be made king, right? So he's giving a prediction about what's going to happen to Abimelech, Abimelech's kingship, right? And then we're going to see that fulfilled. Right? Correct. Okay, so, so to understand this parable, I mean, we think we understand what it means just on, on the level that it is there in that story, that it must refer to the fact that none of these previous judges became king, but the bramble uh, has now been anointed king. And, and then he's predicting what the results of that are going to be. Right. With this if then sort of prophecy. You know, if if this was if this was from God, it will stand. But if not, here's what's going to happen. Right. And that's going to be Judges 19 and 20. Correct. OK. And then in 21, Jotham ran away and fled and went to Beer and dwelt there for fear of Abimelech, his brother. So, so this message of Jotham, whatever this is in our time, it is not, Jotham does not become a judge. Right? He runs away because of his fear of Abimelech. But he still gives this prediction. And then we see the downfall of Abimelech. And he's going to reign for three years. So <clears throat> maybe what we, we would say is that this message is given on November 9th, 2019. Okay, so Angela says, Jotham's historical recount. Uh, so what she's doing is she's comparing this somewhat with what Stephen does in 34 AD when he's sto um, stoned, right? So she says, Jotham's historical recount is more concise than Stephen's, but does, but does remind me of Stephen's in AD 34, right? So 
So that also helps us a little bit in understanding this because 34 AD is a close of probation. Michael stands up. November 9th, 2019 is a close of probation. The message that was given on November 9th, 2019 regarding the 273, those two studies that were presented related to the Mayan calendar, um, is something that we have to pay more attention to in this movement. And the other thing we need to recognize is that on September 23rd, 2017, at the Lambert Church, the message was presented regarding July 18th as a symbol of the prediction before midnight. That is, we understood that there was this prediction before midnight, and this prediction before midnight came to be understood as setting time. And the date given for that was November 9th, 2019. And 391 and a half days before November 9th, 2019, at Lambert Church, a calculation was made confirming that November 9th, 2019 date. So the parable of Jotham is presented to this movement on November 9th, 2019. At the time that a Abimelech is being made king. So we, we talk about, you know, Deborah and Barak, and that's dealing with Sisera, which is representing Parminder's message. We have the story of Gideon, which we say primarily relates to July 18th, and yet it's this illegitimate son of Gideon that is going to be giving this message on November 9th, 2019. So it doesn't appear to be in order, but remember, we're looking at a waymark, and a waymark covers a period of time that includes the previous waymarks. So if we're going to look at the line of Abimelech then, or not Abimelech, uh, Jotham, and maybe, maybe what we should have is a line of Abimelech or different ways in representing these lines, but I have to think that um, what we call Jotham's line here is going to start with Jotham giving this prediction. So, but I think the other line is also valid. That is, here is how I would look at it. Um, so how am I going to do this? We Just like we had these other two lines, I'm going to create another line. And, and with this first line here, I would place dates, that is years. Um, and what we could maybe do is change this slightly from what I would, had suggested. And, and the way that I would do that, let me do it this way here. Um, I definitely think this is 2012. So that's going to be... Um, And, and 2012 has to do with the presentation um, that we're going to, and I'll, I'll give it a specific date. Or dates, or span of time. So I'm putting October 5th to December 21st. Uh, 2012. I was doing that. Okay. It's me. <clears throat> now, October 5th is 777 days before to December 21st, 2012. 
October 5th is my first presentation uh, that I made at a camp meeting that was a weekend camp meeting uh, in this movement in Alberta. It's in Devon. And then on December 21st, 2012, we have the start of the mind date. So that gives us the symbol of 777. <clears throat> now, uh, what we could then do is, um, I'm going to do it this way. Uh, I'm going to put 2014 here. So this is going to be time presented in this movement. And then I'm going to put 2015. So I didn't put 2015 before, but I'm going to put it here because this is in 2015 when I do presentations on Revelation 9. And I think that has to be relevant. And then in 2016, it's Ezekiel. And then 2017 is um, going to be Samuel Snow's letters and the July 18th. So I could put like specific dates on some of these. Um, But, you know, I won't right now, which is just too much time. And then we got 2018. That's going to be the empowerment of the second message. So 2016, I'm putting as Ezekiel as the arrival of this message, of the second message. Um, we'll explain that later. And then I'm going to put 2019. So we're just going to go up to 2019. So what we're saying is that this is um, during this period of time, we have this unfolding of light that's going to confirm November 9th. And, and so then we can put this as um, – so there's two different lines. Now we, maybe what we could call this – I mean, I'm calling it Jotham's line – um, but maybe what we could do is, uh, I don't know how to, how to distinguish it, naming these two lines. Maybe that's not important, but this one is going to, uh, be a period of seven years. This line here is going to be from November 9th to December 25th, 2021. This line will be 777 days. This line here is seven years. Is any of this making sense to people? Major events in 2013? Well, yes. So the major event in 2013, though, is um, is still connected to uh, 2012. I mean, I do do presentations in 2013, right? So I'm going to present the four or seven times. But that, that's still related to 2012. Because that's, that's what's being presented in this history. So, I mean, if we're going to put it, uh, you know, here, I mean, we could just put 2013. <coughs> but 2013, more specifically, is going to be the start of 2013, ending with um, this period from October uh, October 5th to December 21st, ending whatever that is. And then 2013, uh, that would be, um, and that's going to be a major camp meeting. So obviously October 5th, 
to um, August 31st, 2013, if we wanted to put if we wanted to put it that way. But it's going to include this date there. I, I don't know if that that helps. <clears throat> So it's going to include all of 2013. Um, so we're starting on basically the end of, of that 2012. And when we get to November 9th, uh, 2019, Jeff is going to talk about this week of that this probation lingers. So he's going to count from November 9th, a period of seven days. Right. So that's going to be November 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th, and 15th. Now, November 15th is exactly 25, 20 days from December 25th, 2012. So that's a seven prophetic years. So if we count from that December 25th, 2012 to November 15th, 2019, then we have seven years prophetically. Of course, I'm adding 777 days before that. Right. So that, for some people, might be <clears throat> not clear. Is, is this any of this making sense, or am I just living in my own little world. No, it, it's starting to become clearer for me. I mean, Colin and I were talking about this and uh, and I said that a lot of your presentations the last, last little while, I mean, you have personally been so enmeshed in this movement and you've, and you, this is an experiential thing for you mainly. And so my struggle was because I didn't have that experience and I came in late and I missed so much and I know so little, it's been a really a struggle for me. So I've been praying more that the Lord would, would help my mind to open, to grasp a lot more of this. And I think I'm in the process of doing that now. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what we saw happening, thanks for that. So what we saw happening is we saw Parminder developing behind the scenes with a conspiracy to, to overthrow this message. He had a purposeful intent. While that was happening, light was coming to this movement, but, but hidden behind the scenes, but not intentionally. Right? So all, all this light that was coming, regarding the four seven times, regarding um, the structure of prophetic chronology, the, the, the chronology of the Bible and how that, that relates. The understanding of Revelation 9 in its detail dealing with the 26th day of the fourth month. So that's found in 2015. Uh, the understanding of Ezekiel in the 391 and a half years of the kings of Judah. The understanding of Samuel Snow's letters and their structure and their relationship to 457 BC. Uh, then in 2018, using those, that understanding to confirm the November 9th, 2019 date. And then in 2019, tying all of this together. Of course, we also have July 18 in there as well, dealing in 2017 and in 2018. But then in 2019, and, and these are, are all, every one of these is a camp meeting, either in Alberta or in Arkansas, right? So 2013, that's a camp meeting in Alberta. And, and in each one of these camp meetings, uh, Jeff is there, right? The only one that's not particularly a camp meeting, even though, uh, you know, I'm there at the School of the Prophets in 2017. Um, but that's going to be the, the message regarding uh, July 18th. And then, of course, 
2018 and 2019. All of those, 2018 is going to be the camp meeting, even even prior to the camp meeting that happens in the fall. So, so these are all major parts of this message that are going to be presentations of mine. So this is nothing to do with me. This has to do with the fact that there is a message that is being presented that Parminder is rejecting all along the way. Right? Parminder is rejecting all of this light because this light is counteracting. So this is the legitimate light, the 70 sons of Gideon, so to speak. And Parminder is going to push this all aside. But, but Jotham is going to stand as a testimony. So this is a message against Parminder. Right, so Jotham's is going to be about this one eight seven two zero. Now, then, when we look at the line below, this line is so. If we look at this as a review of history, so to speak, that then is the arrival of the third angel's message in that November 9th to November fifteenth time span. Then we would have to look at this line below as representing the history from November 9th to December 25th, 2021. And, and that would have to be represented by the fall of Abimelech. That is, Abimelech is a message that isn't, isn't particularly Parminder. But it has to do with this conspiracy, this, this self-exaltation that is going on within this movement. Parminder's, in a sense, part of it, of course. But it's not just Parminder. It's all who have stood opposed to the light in this period of time. All of the messages that have been counterproductive. And, and so now we're going to see from November 9th, so, so we would call this maybe the line of Abimelech, if we wanted to put it that way, uh, the line below. So we have Jotham's line and Abimelech's line. But Abimelech's line then is relating to this prediction Okay, does that make sense? Because he reigns three years over Israel, November 9th to 2021. It would seem logical. Okay, so then we have to understand what this message of Abimelech because God sent an evil spirit between Abimelech and the men of Shechem, and the men of Shechem dealt treacherously with Abimelech. So we need to understand what that means. That the cruelty done to the threescore and ten sons of Jeroboam might come, and their blood be laid upon Abimelech, their brother. So I'll go back to the scripture here. <clears throat> which slew them, and upon the men of Shechem, which aided him in the killing of his brethren. So the men of Shechem, of course, uh, we know that this is an attitude or a spirit. Now, this is, to me, this is the spirit of Adventism, um, just to be sort of um, well, I was going to say blunt. I don't know how blunt it is. Um, so Angela just says about. Jotham's name reminds us we are to look to a perfect God who wants to perfect us and not to look for human uh, misleadership. Um, and that's because Jotham's name means what? What's Jotham's name mean? Anybody? It means Yahweh is perfect. Yeah, 
so yeah so this the perfection of of yahweh um and the, the hebrew there specifically is is um, two different words of obviously Yehovah and the other one is Tom, which means complete, uh, morally pious, specifically gentle, dear, coupled together, perfect, plain, undefiled, upright. Um, and uh, so this has to do with um, a type of per perfection that's a type of maturity, a gentleness, a kindness, uh, the character of Christ. So this is a message that is given in the character of Christ. And, and it counteracts this message of Abimelech, which is self-exaltation and usurpation, right? This is the jealousy. So within this movement, these things have existed. Even though Parminder's message came to an end, that message still continued in this movement. Not, not so much in the teachings, though those are there, but in the approaches that we have to how we decide what is truth, that position and power and persuasion and all of these, these human ways of trying to convince somebody that something is truth uh, have prevailed. That there isn't this open communication, loving support, uh, examination of the scriptures together as brothers and sisters has not existed from November 9th, 2019 up to December 25th, 2021. Now at that point, <clears throat> And just addressing December 25th, 2021, because we know that for a year, we basically, um, you know, at least I can say that I wasn't participating in the other studies that were going on, that we focused upon the studies that we, we were doing. I mean, I, I listened occasionally, but there, a separation in the movement had occurred there as well. But all, all the time, it was our goal was to seek to unite the movement, to bring the movement together, to understand why we had got to that point where the movement was unwilling to work together. Personally, I had to look at what I was doing to try to figure out what mistakes I had made. And, and everyone was to do that. That is, that's what we are to do. Now, the downfall of Abimelech, if you look at this, is, um, is represented with this men of Shechem dealing treacherously with Abimelech. So there's a conflict here. Now, God sent an evil spirit between Abimelech and the men of Shechem. So the men of Shechem represents what, what idea? It, are the men of Shechem any different than Abimelech? Not really. No. Okay. So if we look at what happened after November 9th um, in this movement, I saw people, um, well, we didn't follow Parminder, right? They were proud of the fact that they hadn't been deceived by Parminder. At least some people felt they hadn't been. And um, it was always about those people, you know, who accepted Parminder or error or whatever. And yet the spirit being manifested in the movement was really the same spirit. And we know that because it led to the same, the exact same conclusions, right, on December 6, 2020. We have a declaration that basically is reiterating the same arguments that Parminder had used against July 18th and attacking the same people that Parminder had attacked. So it was no different. 
and and we can see that that here Abimelech has you know been made king, but the men of Shechem they haven't changed in heart at all. The same spirit that made them put Abimelech on the throne is is the same critical spirit. Now, of course, the whole purpose of this message is to get rid of this spirit, right? So that we can have the character of Jotham, right? Or that's being represented there symbolically. Jehovah is perfect. A, a, perfect, a perfect character that manifests gentleness. Something that we don't have. Right? We haven't been gentle with those in, that we see as being in error. He that judges another man does the same things. We are no different than the people that we condemn. Yeah, so there's this disharmony, right, that exists among God's people. And um, now we could say Parminders and Tess as followers, but I would say that it's it's after Parminder and Tess. This isn't about Parminder and Tess. Parminder and Tess are irrelevant now as far as the lines are concerned. After November 9th, we're not looking at their movement. Nothing that they are doing is prophetically significant. We're not looking at the dates in their movement or the messages that are being given. We have no idea what they're doing, but it's not prophetically significant. But that same spirit continued in this movement. So then what's going to happen, it says in verse 25, the men of Shechem set their liars in wait for him in the top of the mountains. And they robbed all that came along that way by them. And it was told to Bimelech. So what is this symbolizing? Because this, this is a rather complicated story, this downfall of Abimelech. I mean, we've been through it a couple of times. Okay, I'm going to read this, read this over and see if we can make sense of it in the context of what we've just talked about. When Abimelech had reigned three years over Israel, then God sent to me evil spirit between Abimelech and the men of Shechem. And the men of Shechem dealt treacherously with Abimelech, that the cruelty done to the three score ten sons of Jeroboam might come, and their blood be laid upon Abimelech their brother, which slew them, and upon the men of Shechem, which aided him in the killing of his brethren. And the men of Shechem set liars in wait for him in the tops of of the mountains. So we know that the top is going to be, I'll get these numbers back here. Um, but that's just going to be Rosh, right? That that means head, chief, right? That word that has all of the, in the Hebrew, um, Strong's Hebrew numbers are 7218. So you're going to see July and the 2020 and the 18 all there in that symbol. And mountains are harim, right? Har in singular, harim in plural, right? So the tops of the mountains. So these represent something, right? So they lie in wait in the tops of the mountains and they robbed all that came along by the way, that by uh, that way by them, and was it was told to Bimelech. And Gaal, the son of Ebed, came with his brethren and went over to Shechem and the men of Shechem put their confidence in him. Now this Gaal is bitterness. And actually the name itself is, is uh, onomatopoeic, right? So that is, it's, it's, it's basically a gagging sound, right? <clears throat> that if you tasted something, 
bitter what what expression you would make ah, right so that's that's the name gall and he's the son of ebed and um ebed means servant right so he's the son of a servant and he came with his brethren and went over to shechem and the men of shechem put their confidence in him so so there's this bitterness that is going to um, be the spirit that is manifest. Now, this is um, uh, this 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 gag reflex. What what is it? It's part of of what um, system in the human body? Anybody know? It's it's one of our systems. We have the different systems, you know, circulatory system. And isn't, it, isn't it a reaction based in the digestive system? Okay. It is, it, it's manifest in the digestive system, but it's actually part of the immune system. Why do I say that? Because the immune system is there to keep and protect the body from invasion from without. Right. So things that cause us to gag they smell bad and all those things. They're all bad things. They're poisons or toxins. And so it's, it's the first response of the immune system, right? So that we, we don't eat things that are going to be bad for us. <clears throat> Keeps us away from diseased bodies and so forth. So, and, and this was utilized uh, during the pandemic, Right. Uh, it was utilized during Nazi Germany, right? Uh, Jews being vermin, right? That's part of the disgust system, right? And disgust is a very powerful um, uh, reflex response that is often being often used, just like it's, been, it's related to fear, right? So this spirit of disgust is, uh, yeah, the vagus nerve, I think, controls gag reflex, possibly. I don't know. Or vagus nerve. So anyway, the point is we have <clears throat> um, disgust, right? So people are made, uh, and we can see that when, you know, Adventists, if you, if you say that somebody's shepherd's rod, that's in a sense creating a, uh, intellectual gag response. Uh, the person's intellect shuts down and all that takes over is a reflex. You know, so you say that 2520 is related to shepherd's rod or something. Nobody will look at it, right? So so this is the type of spirit that was existing within this movement, our, our personal distaste on people's personalities or rumors and gossip that we hear. So these things... Uh, inhibit us from examining truth, right? So people, you know, if you, you say, something, what's that? Yeah. So if you say something's a Jehovah's witness doctrine, you know, like the 2520, that's a Jehovah's witness doctrine. Well, people won't even look at it, even though we could say the same thing about the state of the dead. If you wanted to. Um <clears throat> But this is a spirit that took over this movement in response to um, Abimelech, right? Which, of course, is another bad spirit. <clears throat> um, so they put their confidence in Gaal, and they went out into the fields, gathered the vineyards, trod the grapes, made merry. They went into the house of their god and did eat and drink and cursed Abimelech. Now, I mean, I know we're not supposed to take this really literally, though. I mean, I'm not. But when we took look at vineyards, vineyards represent 
um, doctrines or teachings, and then you're going to tr uh, tread upon the grapes, right? Grapes is an added word, but that's implied in trode. Um, so they're going to take these vineyards, they're going to make grape juice or wine, and then they're going to make merry and went into the house of the God to eat and drink and curse the Bimelech. And, and, and so this spirit has existed within this movement. Now, all the son of Ebed said, who is Abimelech and who is Shechem that we should serve him? Now, Shechem, of course, is the men of Shechem, right? So when they're talking about Shechem, what are they talking about? What do they mean should sh serve Shechem? Because it says, is not he the son of Jeroboam? So what, what is this talking about here? And Zebul, his officer, served the men of Habor, the, the father of Shechem, for why should we serve him? So what is this going back to? What, what is this a reference to? Like, why is he saying that Shechem's the son of Jeroboam? Is he using this as an analogy? Um, well, definitely it has to be an analogy because literally it can't be true. So what, what is the analogy? What is the story that it's going back to? Is it going back to when Jacob and his family came into the promised land? Okay, so, so it's going back to that story. Now we know that um, Jeroboam, right? That's the name for Gideon. He tore down the altar, right? right of correct. Now, so so is she so he's he's actually going against the truth here. I mean, not just the truth, but this is a rejection. This Gaal is going to rep represent people in the movement who are going to turn away from. The message completely. Right? December 6, 2020 declaration. Does that not represent what's being here? What is yes. this? Yeah, okay. Because that's what we see. So they're going to reject Jeroboam, right? Because they're not even interested in in Abimelech, because he's the son of, of, uh, of, um, because he's the son of Jeroboam, right? But he says, who is Shechem that we should serve him? Is not he the son of Jeroboam? Who is Abimelech? Now, Abimelech's the son of Jeroboam, but he's asked who is Shechem. So, I mean, we could just say, he's just saying Abimelech is the son of Jeroboam. But he's asking who is who is Shechem that we should serve him. So he's connecting this this idea that Shechem represents that that this that this is all about that we need to go back to idolatry, right? So it talks about the men of Hamor, uh, the father of Shechem, right? So we have to go back to that story. So if we go back to this story, we go back to Hamor. Um, no, not that I know of. I don't know of any son named Shechem. <clears throat> Okay, 
so this story here is in Genesis um, 33. So let's, let's. <clears throat> so Jacob, uh, journeying to Succoth, built him a house, made booths for his cattle. Therefore, the name of the place is called Succoth or booths. And Jacob came to Shalem, the city of she a city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan. When he came to, from Padam Aram, right? Um, so that is the area of um, the plateau of the region of Syria, right? Aram represents Syria. And pitched his tent before the city. And he bought a parcel of a field where he had spread his tent at the hand of a hundred at the hand of the children of Hamor, Shechem's father, for a hundred pieces of money. And he erected there an altar and called it Elahoe Israel. Elahoe Israel, which is um, the mighty God of Israel. <clears throat> and then in chapter 34, this story continues. Um, so we know that when Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hivite prince of the country, saw her, he took her and lay with her and defiled her. So um, this is going to be that story with Dinah. Um, and I know we looked at this before. I can't remember what we concluded. So we know that what's going to happen is Simeon and Levi, they're going to kill the men of Hamor or, or the men of Shechem. Hamor and Shechem are going to be killed and, and all these other people killed. Um, so what, what, how would we relate this story? I think it's more about the buying of the land, but um What's the what's the issue here? What's the reference then? Deceit and murder, right? Uh, in Gen Genesis thirty four and Judges nine, okay. Anything else? What about this land that's purchased? This field. What should land symbolize? Um. Well, it can symbolize lots of things, but he buys this parcel of a field. It says 100 pieces of money. Uh, literally, it's uh, lambs, I guess. But it says some people think that that's what it is. But here we're looking at what, what starts, what leads to what was going to happen in the following chapter. Yeah. Right. So we know that this is going to be the defiling of Dinah. And then uh, uh, Levi and Simeon uh, killing all these people. Right, they, they get the males circumcised, and while they're recovering, they come in and um, and remember, we have the third day connected with that. It came to pass on the third day when they were sore that the two sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brethren, took each man's his sword and came upon the city boldly and slew all the males. They slew Hamor and Shechem his son with the edge of the sword and took Dinah out of Shechem's house and went out.
of course, Jacob's upset about it. Well, of course. I mean, here's Jacob. He's establishing his family in what is supposed to be the promised land. Yeah. But he's establishing his family near those that are not of God's children. Okay. Could it be said that he is, well, was some type of a league being established between the house of Jacob and the house of Hamor? Hmm. Okay, we'll go on. Go on. Well, The marriage relation is a covenant, right? Yeah. So after Shechem has defiled Dinah, mm -hmm. he then seeks to enter into covenant with Dinah's family. Yeah. Now, that's not in the order that God would have it done. Yes. So, Levi and Simeon, also out of God's order, are aware that the men of Shechem which would include Shechem, which would include Hamor, which would include all of those under their rulership, were then to be circumcised. Mm -hmm. So they were not walking by faith. They were just walking by sight. Yeah, so there's some parallel here. I don't know if I fully understand it. Um. So if we look at verse 28 here in Judges 9, then. So Gaal, the son of Ebed, said, who is Abimelech and who is Shechem, that we should serve him? So, I mean, technically, uh, he's, he's talking about two different things. Who's Abimelech and who is Shechem? Um, is not he the son of Jeroboam? That would be Abimelech, I would think. Right. And Zebul, his and Zebul, his officer. The officer of who? So who is Zebul? Wasn't he the representative of um, Abimelech? Right. So uh, here. It's the first time that he's mentioned, right? So we don't know. So it's he's going to be mentioned. So Zebul is the ruler of the city, it says in verse 30. So he wouldn't be connected with Abimelech per se, right? So so it says that Zebul is his officer. So he's he's the mayor of Shechem. So, so this is a parallelism, the way that this sentence is written then. Who is Abimelech? Is not he the son of Jeroboam? Who is Shechem, that we should serve him? And Zebul, his officer. That, um, serve the men of Hamor, the father of Shechem, for why should we serve him, right? So the whole idea is um, he's rebelled against everything, Gaal. Right. He's rejected the whole kit and caboodle. He's he's thrown out the baby with the bath water. He just looks at what has happened. And. And and he is going to want to rule. Right. He said, and would to God this people were under my hand. Then I would remove Abimelech, and he said to Abimelech, increase thine army and come out. Right? 
So he, he challenges Abimelech. And then Zebul, the ruler of the city, heard the words of Gaal, the son of Ebed. His anger was kindled. Right? So, I mean, we went through all this before, but we're, we're trying to sort this out in the context of, of, of what we now understand, because we see it a bit more clearly. Um, so he sent messengers unto Abimelech privily, saying, Behold, Gaal, the son of Ebed and his brethren, be come to Shechem, and behold, they fortify the city against thee. Now, therefore, for up by night, thou and the people that is with thee, and lie in wait in the field. So we're going to have to come back to this tomorrow. Um, and so, you know, people are going to have to take a look at this. But we've gone through this before. And, and we related this all to December 6, 2020. Um, the spirit that ended up in that division that happened there in the movement. But let's see if that, that can bear out and how we can place this upon the lines. Any final comments before we close with prayer? Not for me right now. Okay. okay, well, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the time we had to study here uh, this morning. Uh, we know, Lord, that we need the spirit of Jotham, a gentleness, a Christ-like character, uh, a perfect character. And we know, Lord, that so often we are drawn into uh, these human battles. Um, we are drawn into um, an area that we are not supposed to go. And we ask for forgiveness. We ask that you can use us uh, to win hearts to you. Continue to be with this movement. And for the plans that we have, um, we know, Lord, that there's much to do. Help us to obey you each day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.